back to September 2017. On the 6th, an X-9 solar flare erupted from a large sunspot group and as it turned over the limb, four days later it released an X-class flare as it crested. The first paper today is a fun hint at the total electrical connectivity of the solar system. They say that even at X-8 and not pointed at Earth, like the X-9 was a few days earlier, it still produced 16% higher ionospheric current anomalies than that larger X-9 which again was indeed aimed at Earth. How is that possible? Well, that second one wasn't really an X-8. If it hadn't been hiding behind the limb, we could have seen the totality of what was likely an X-10 to X-15 solar flare. The connected nature of the planets and sun through interplanetary magnetic fields and the sun's electric current sheet allowed a much more powerful flare to trigger stronger currents, even though it was facing away from Earth. FYI, with Earth's weakening magnetosphere, we're looking between the yellow X-10 and the orange X-15 line for that one. There's already about a 20% chance that such an eruption would take out the grids with its induced effect in EMP, if it was facing Earth directly. On our risk chart from spaceweathernews.com, we must recall that the X-9 from four days earlier had triggered geomagnetic storms, so we would have been closer to the 35-40% to 40 chance of collapse if that last 2017 eruption was aimed at Earth. Up next, folks, we use the illustrious animations all the time because they are incredible to look at. But of course, they have problems, not the least of which being they are utterly controlled by a mysterious dark matter that probably isn't real and which they definitely don't understand. Today, we'll find another problem, the evolution of gas and dust. Illustrious has it far too slow, and that's probably because the number one matter constituent in Illustrious doesn't really interact with normal matter, that would be the dark matter, but the real matter they are still failing to see in total pushes the processes along much more quickly. Folks, this preprint came out on October 8th, 2018. I remember it, didn't think much of it, and still don't, but what they transformed it into over the last two years happens to be gold. In the original paper, they quacked with a plasma cosmology like magnetism of M51, but there were no feathers and it didn't like water. Not a word about the vertical component of the fields. The word Parker did not appear in the first try two years ago, but boy, it's there now. We can look at their outer galactic disk magnetism and say it is a good shot at being a legit path forward for the large-scale operation of the system, but also... The system ripples in the disk, causing what are described to be frequent reversals of the magnetic fields within the disk. And of course, this is the galactic current sheet up and down, separating the north and south magnetic sectors of the system. At galaxies, at stars, in a lab and in math on paper, this sheet excites the disk plane when it crosses it, as we see in gamma returns from the Milky Way. And we not only have seen the nearby stars activating nearby stars to the sun, to record levels of activity, and the other planets in the solar system all enduring major changes alongside the Earth. But of course, there's that leading wave of density upon us in space as well, coming from the center of the galaxy. Earth's catastrophe cycle is getting ready to reset again. A triple here to close, starting with a confirmation from top global scientists and forestry experts, including NASA's top researcher in this subfield, suggesting that it is forest management that controls fire severity and carbon release not climate change. Did you know that more than half the states in the U.S. have higher forest content than the states currently on fire in the West? That's because it's not the weather, it's bad forest management. Up next, we already know that solar activity controls ENSO modulations and semi-permanent pressure cells like the South Asian High. Here we find it actually also controls their interaction and the actual effects of the large phase and mode patterns. Last but not least, add it to the dozens of what we've already seen saying the same thing. The sun is what controls the ups and downs of temperature. It not only does this through the irradiance, which was the focus of this paper, but in the cosmic ray modulation, which helps to modify clouds and cloud reflectivity, but also the ozone effects of the solar protons. Imagine to what degree they'd discover solar control if they actually put all of those into a study.